So, hello, and welcome to uh, episode three of season two of What You've Been Looking For. Uh, I'm joined, uh, as usual, by my two wonderful co-hosts, uh, Helen and Natalie. And today we're looking at or talking about um, job mm. insecurity and redundancy. And what does that say about your um, your well-being? And you know, if it says anything about your well-being at all. And one of the things I was thinking about as as we were, you know, as we think about this, don't we, as the week comes up, and, and I was thinking, well, actually, I've never been redundant. I've never faced that fear. Um, there's obviously times in my life where there's been kind of a sense of job insecurity because there always is in you know, things happen in industry and especially in some of the work that I've been in. Um, but in the military, when I was in the military, it fairly much in you know, a fairly secure job anyway. So there was never really any about that. So there's a bit of kind of insecurity here about talking about this from this perspective. It's like, well, I've, I've never faced that kind of fear, but I've faced similar fears in my life as well. Um, so maybe uh, there'll be some parallels people can take from that. But anyway, let's see what your thoughts are on this, Natalie and Helen. Have you ever been made redundant? What are your experiences of it? I've not been made redundant. <laughs> we always do this. Um, <laughs> I've, I've not been made redundant, but I have definitely had an experience of feeling insecure in a job while being in a job. So it's interesting that it seems like the having the job or the not having the job is, is the insecurity, whereas I've definitely felt what they call imposter syndrome in jobs where I've had that feeling of, oh, my God, I'm going to get found out because I can't actually do this job. That kind of negative critique going on in my mind. So I can definitely relate to a sense of insecurity in the context of a career. Mm. Yeah, I've not been made redundant either, but used to be in the HR seat, working with the leaders to make people <laughs> redundant. Um, and I guess we seeing it from the other side and seeing um, seeing the different responses to it, really. Mm -hmm. And and also knowing lots of people who have been made redundant. And so it's that it's almost like that whole process of the different responses leading up to the the actual redundancy happening, and then the experience post redundancy which of course is not like there's not a vanilla there's not a one size fits all mm -hmm. but there are some tendencies that that you can see and i guess the fact that we've all got different experiences is kind of the point like it wouldn't be true to sit here and go yeah we've all got this one blanket example or experience of of insecurity in a work context but it's there in various guises for everybody mm -hmm. And yeah, just right now, it looks very, looks very real. It looks very um, definite that it's a terrible thing to lose your job. Um, so as with so many things just now with the virus, it's just that it's a great opportunity to have these conversations because everything's so emphasized, so extreme, so exaggerated. We can really start to, yeah, paradoxically because it's so seemingly big it's the chance to really break through to the other side and mm -hmm. see what it really is all about and I think also I know we've talked historically about money and that there is going to be an element of practicality around having a job but for families is a very it's a confronting issue isn't it the idea of what do I do if I can't bring fa like money in to put food on the table for my family so I think there's added tears to the job security one because there's a, oh, I have this role, but I could have a different role in the future that has a bit more freedom around it. But then there's the, oh, my God, panic of I need money. Money has to come mm. in for, for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was just, just speaking, I was actually thinking, you know, I've been fired um, before. So but that was when I was um, in my teens, I think, mm -hmm. um, where I got made redundant. And maybe I got uh, not made redundant. Basically, got told my skills um, as an industrial cleaner were no longer needed. Um, so, so I've had that. <laughs> I had that. Um, uh, yeah, it's. I suppose the the challenge is is that you know the the fear around you know especially if you're if you're somebody who has responsibilities, you have a family. You may but might be the the uh, the main breadwinner in that family. Um, you know, you might be the one that's that's bringing in the, the main income. There's going to be a lot of fear and insecurity 
and um, anxiety about the situation. Um, and the thing that occurs to me is that, you know, it's very trite to say, well, that fear and insecurity has always been there because none of us are secure in any way, shape or form. Um, at any point in our life but in those situations it's all you know really brought up to the surface like the whole COVID thing has kind of brought all that up to the surface anyway this this kind of inherent insecurity that that we have and then it just gets magnified with a lot more um, uh, realness we were saying um, more tangibility to it and then but I would think you know being in the heart of that fear is is also very not really conducive to seeing your way through it either mm. is that you know what we're actually fearing is is the the imagined future or the worst case scenario and part of this also when you're in those situations is about for me anyway at least here is thinking about well actually sometimes it's about really facing that truth sometimes about these kind of fears it's really about facing the truth of where you are right now um, and facing that truth, just to seeing it as it is and, and understanding that the fear of it is not going to be the thing that's going to um, stop you um, thriving or succeeding in, uh, in the future. It's the, the fear of it is going to be the thing that's going to keep you locked into a situation of not finding a way out of it. You know, you're going to be in this kind of flight or fright mode, flow mode where, you know, most people, when they get fear, they go into one of those modes and they either flop or they're going to freeze or they're going to, you know, panic and run around a little bit or maybe a combination of all of them as you kind of flip all the time between any of them. And it's seeing that you're, inherent well-being is already already here in those quiet moments because it's not going to be a continuous process of fear is it yeah i guess even in that i see uh yeah i just see the brilliance of the like the, there's nothing wrong with the fight flight freeze response mm -hmm. like the from a from a person who thinks like you said nat <clears throat> if my well-being seems to rely on having a job because having a job brings in money and money means food on the table. There's so many layers there that have been identified with and, and fixed as truths. And so, and that's, that's what gets us lost, but there's nothing wrong with that lostness. It's the, I guess the difference with this work compared to perhaps other work, other development work is that it's the opportunity to turn around from oh yes, I'm definitely going to lose my job. It's definitely going to be a terrible outcome. It's definitely going to mean I can't get another job. It's definitely going to mean I don't have money to put food on the table. And we're, we're, we invite the turnaround away from those definites. Well, I guess, first of all, to look at them and see that they're not definites and also to turn around and see what else is here. Um, because yeah, it's, it's only in those definites that we will be in fight, flight, freeze. And that's okay because that's, yeah, that's going to happen. And yet also, we're amazingly capable of navigating through fight, flight, freeze. Like, you'll see people in stress responses, but who still get food on the table, or who still manage to find another job, or who still get the kids up and dressed and in the olden days off to school. Um, there's, yeah, there's still, you know, life's still living there. Life's still just happening in the midst of some confusion. Mm. It's like the discrepancy between what is arising, what is unfolding, what is happening, and then the narrative that we place over that. Mm -hmm. that seems so, it's always there, so we don't even see it. Like the commentary that's going, going on all the time, we take that to be truth, don't we? Because it seems so real to us. And why wouldn't we until we start to question it and get curious about what that is? But it's only when we really associate with those what if, oh my God, that that, that becomes the world for us, that world of fear and, and restriction and, and no way forward. And then the natural coming out of that, which inevitably happens because we've talked about the buoyancy of the design and how we flow back up to the surface, is what affords us the space to know when to make the next move. Or it, it just happens, doesn't it? The next move mm. happens rather than forcing a move. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and in amongst all that, yeah, in amongst all that stress and all that narrative, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there is, there is just still, it's just, it, there is only then our opinion that it's wrong, mm. that I shouldn't be feeling this, mm. that then actually layers on more story and layers mm. on more confusion. Mm. Because we're now saying, yeah, not only all those layers before about, I should have a job and I need to put money, have money to put food on the table, and it shouldn't be like this, mm. and and it should be different. And that's like, that's the, you know, that quote about pain is inevitable, inevitable and suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, all those layers of stories of the suffering and the, the basic pain might be, God, I really love this job and I'm really sad if it's going to go and mm -hmm. really sad if the company's going to be closing or whatever the situation is. That's like the core, that's the, that's the pain of, of loss that we feel when anything goes and the suffering of all the layers of story above it are, are, are the bit that we rather than going into thinking they need to be fixed <clears throat> can be seen and then we look to the fact that yeah like you said night life's life's still happening mm -hmm. underneath all that mm -hmm. i suppose also the um the reality of the the situation at the moment where a lot of people are going to be um you know, losing work. I mean, there's there's already you see that happening. That there's, there's quite a lot of people that in in industries and especially in things like airline industries and travel and tourism that that are, are losing their livelihoods um, right now. Um, it's also sometimes it's it's difficult to say, but also that in that in that loss of of that, it's, it's kind of sounds to me like there's a loss of identity there as well. Sometimes is that you like there's a, you know, especially a lot of us go, you know, what am I going to do? Because this is who I've been for so long and mm -hmm. I don't know who I'm going to be next or I haven't got any idea about that or I can't do anything else than other than the things that I've done uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least for myself and my own journey, I mean, like this point out there, I started off, you know, one of my first jobs was as a pizza, pizza chef and then I, I went to be an industrial cleaner. <laughs> then I think I did something else. Oh yeah, then I was a quality controller for a drinks company and then from there I went into the airports from there I went into the car industry and from the car industry I went to um, uh, into project management and from project management I, I went into my own consultancy business and that then um, went bankrupt so um, then from there <laughs> there I went into like a wobbly area uh, and now I end up in this kind of space where I don't even really know what I do at the moment <laughs> I can't really define it and, and at every point looking back there's been a belief that I've been in control of it all and that I made all the decisions and that I did all these things but now in the, the space of where I am now I can look back and see well actually I wasn't in control of anything at any point and things just happened and I you know decisions were made and um you're still coming back to this security of well actually i'm still here and i'm still alive and yes there was loss along that way um but out of that destruction there was always something you created and there's always some new opportunity mm -hmm. that, that came along as well um mm -hmm. and i think and i don't know whether this is true or not this is probably one of those really kind of urban myths that the the chinese character for for crisis is also the same as opportunity i don't know but that's you know but it's a nice story so we'll say anyway um <laughs> yeah, you know there is there is opportunity in in these moments at the same time mm -hmm. as there is um but it might as part of gaining that opportunity you might have to let go of something at the same time you might have to go okay well i have to part this narrative about myself that i've had for so long and um there'll be a new narrative that comes up as well mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, Nat. Okay. Sometimes that narrative, because so, that's the only thing. Mm. So believing that narrative of this is who I am, this is the type of work I do, this is the type of business I work in, or this is the business I work in. Believing that narrative to be true is the, is the only thing that that is the is the cause of suffering. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, sometimes we'll go through like a natural, almost grieving process. For the loss of that if we are forced out of a job or even like for me I chose to leave my job <clears throat> and the organization and I still went through a grieving process there's still mm -hmm. a sense of loss that gosh I've been there 10 years and it meant so much to me and great people that I worked with and all the jobs I'd done so yeah sometimes if you know the loss of that identity can be 
can feel like grieving. And I guess experiences like just now where we've really been literally dropped in the deep end with so many changes, which like people I've been talking to where they've said, gosh, my organization would never have moved to this home working Mm -hmm. as quickly unless this had come along. And people who previously have been so resistant and like, oh no, we can never work at home and people won't be productive and I could never do it. You know, I'll get distracted by baking cakes or doing the washing or whatever. And yet now they're all doing it and being very productive and very capable and yeah, it's all fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe there will be an experience of loss, but I think sometimes when we're really dropped into it, it's like it happens so fast. We, We just immediately leap from oh no no, that's not me anymore yeah now I'm working from home it's just obvious like Mm -hmm. why would I not be I've got to so it just really shows how the ideas of of who we think we are and and what we think makes us who we are jobs and organizations and seniority just aren't true because yeah that working from home is a situation an example of a situation where we can immediately lose stories of who I think I am and what I'm capable of because we're just made to Mm. and the more we see the yeah the just the nothingness of those ideas then that's the whole game up isn't it Mm. yeah and it's so it's so so tempting to want to bypass the difficult stuff or what we we're calling difficult stuff because that's what we equate those you know those stronger feelings with so we talk about pain and we talk about suffering and we talk about grief and those are part of the experience of life Mm. and yet really what we're saying is how can I avoid that I really want to step around that and get to the next place without experiencing that but I would argue that you go through those experiences and something beautiful can emerge on the other side of it Mm. by going through it and being open to it and knowing that it can't it looks so much from this place that that could really hurt me or that could really overwhelm me. But when you allow it through and see that you are the space in which it is moving through, it can't, but we have to, we have to see that ourselves, don't we? And experiencing it ourselves, it's all very well telling with the people, but. Yeah, no, but it's a very good point, isn't it? That so often in these situations, there's, there's a, um, a kind of desire or a, a, to solve it as soon as possible without giving mm-hmm. yourself the time and space to to grieve it and you know like you said Ellen, even though sometimes it's your own decision to leave a company and you still have to go through a grieving process mm-hmm. and a loss process because that's you know who we are as human beings that human beings will go through that process and um, you've got to allow time and space for that process to happen and the more you resist that process of loss the more you resist that process of you know, that loss of identity as well, a little bit um, around it, the the greater that suffering is going to be. Um, and that process will take longer than it needs to take. And it's in the, it's in just relaxing into it and just say, and some of that point, point was saying like, well, facing the truth of it as well. It's like, oh, okay, well, I did define my life by these criteria mm-hmm. and they do seem real to me. And I need to um, sit with that and allow that to, to, um, you know kind of percolate at a deep level so that i can come out of it at the other side kind of renewed and refreshed and i, and I processed it and so much of our, our lives and things are done in this space of like oh going as fast as possible oh i need to you know i just have to take the first thing that comes along and i've done that in my past and and realized that well actually that you know if i should have should have could have i know we can't say those kind of things but it kind of feels like maybe that might have could have gone a different way if I decided just to sit and wait um, and realize that actually in the moment I'm normally okay. Um, you know, in the moment I normally have most things available to me right now. And if um, and if you're in that space where you haven't got those things, that kind of thing, you know, the kind of really basic points of security, then those are also the times to, to also tell your truth of yourself, the truth about that, and ask yourself, right, you know. Do I need to get help? Who, who can I turn to? Who do I need to get support from for this? And not feel that I can't ask for, for help and support in these situations either. Yeah, and that for me is when you're saying like, oh, I've normally had everything available. Mm-hmm. I would say 
you know, everything has always been available. Everything always is available. It's just we might, or the mind, the self, the identity will categorize it into this is what I need to have. This is what I should have. Mm -hmm. And in, and it's in the it's in the seeing through that that then yeah you can go oh yeah but I could just ask that person like that was always available. It was just in a in a narrow perspective, which yes could occur through fight flight freeze response. It looked like that wasn't an option. No, no, no. I've got to be self sufficient. I've got to do this all by my on my own and be independent and be a go getter. And you know, seeing through that, then it, it it's like, well, that's not true, is it? Mm -hmm. And then everything that's already there became seeable, obvious, available. Yeah. It was always 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 there. It's just in in a moment of confusion, we don't we don't spot it yeah. and that's yeah that's maybe even something for people to just be aware of if they're in that experience of insecurity about the job what's going to happen it's it's maybe just noticing that in and outness of that yeah. like mm -hmm. you, even if you're feeling worried notice how you're not feeling worried all the time mm -hmm. yeah unless you start thinking about the job and what's going to happen in the future and you create that stack 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 story domino effect of oh, and then this and this and this and this and this way off in the imagination and yeah guess what you're going to feel worried if you think about that kind of thing mm -hmm. and then notice when you when you're not in that how <clears throat> ideas might come like oh yeah I could ask that person for help they could help me with my tv that oh that person i know works in that place i wonder if they're hiring and you know it's just notice that like ebb and flow mm -hmm and how natural it is and how you don't need to do anything to change it. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Which leads seamlessly to a question that we've had from um, Andy, which is about worry. So he says, if a person is continuously worried about what their job will look like once they return to it, how can they tell if what they're feeling is insecure belief or truth, given that it all looks so real? Yeah, so... I don't personally I don't think it's helpful to try and figure out is this wisdom or not yeah so my um okay so sometimes I might think oh yeah that that feels like a genius idea like not mine it's just appeared mm -hmm. oh yeah that's a brilliant way through this that's a brilliant yeah next step for and that that might feel like wisdom but whenever I've been caught up about something and trying to figure out what's the answer mm. first of all the fact that I'm like mm. I'm thinking there is a right answer the fact I'm thinking I should know now the fact I'm thinking that this I'm experiencing at the moment is not okay and needs to be different like all of that is indications that I'm probably not in my clearest state of mind but there's nothing wrong with it and any for me any attempt to kind of go oh well I'll just I'll just wait until I until there's something really wise to do you can just tangle yourself up in that and and either do nothing or get so busy trying to make yourself be wise like oh my god where's that where's that wisdom I need it now because this isn't okay and it, and it should be like that over there um so I kind of and, and I guess you know not by magic but by lots of inquiry lots of exploration for myself there's been a falling away of ideas of the good, bad and right, wrong. And so now it's just life happens. And the thing I trust in is that if I'm experiencing resistance of some kind from an apparent person out there or experience out there, I know that the only place to look is here. I know that there's nothing. It's not to do with that person. It's not to do with that situation. I know there's something being believed and held as fixed and true here. And the more that that's where I've looked, the more that, yeah, life happens and life expresses and life goes from activity to activity without needing to worry about, oh, is this, is this wisdom or not? Like mm -hmm. that just, that can only come from a mind that thinks there's a wiser way to do life than yeah, yeah. in one way than another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really about, for me, wisdom um, more and more mm -hmm. is becoming about what, what just seems reasonable for me to do in the next moment. Um, without even really thinking about it, mm. is staying in a state of um, 
I'm going to say no thought, but that that kind of indicates that you're not thinking, but just not really putting any thought on anything and just, you know, whatever is seems natural to come up because the wisdom is in the process of allowing it to unfold as it is mm. um, rather than um, waiting for some contrived moment in the future where you have a thought and it feels good to you and you think, oh, well, that's my wisdom right there and I need to wait for this magical thought to pop up in my head um, when I'm in the shower that's going to tell me what I need to do next. No, you just... You know the universe unfolds and you unfold with it and mm. wisdom is is the what is the thing that occurs for me to do next in this moment mm. and and that so often is completely different to what you've been thinking about anyway i mean so often i'm walking around and my mind's going oh i need to do this and it's going off to you know go in the kitchen and it comes down and it writes something else it will start a blog post so I'm, Mm. okay that was not what what i was thinking it was going to be doing and but the wisdom is in that is the wisdom's mm. in allowing the intelligence that, that is in life, the, the the thing that's behind it all, is to allow it to 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 flow through you and put and into the next moment so that you move along with it, and just act in whatever seems reasonable to you in that moment to act on. Mm -hmm. Allowance of everything is okay, like we said earlier. Whatever emotion, whether that's fear, anxiety, panic, um, you know, freeze. Um, you know, whatever com is coming up to you for you, you would just have that allowance, knowing that, that that's they're going to be the action that you need to take forward in the next moment, because mm -hmm. it will find its way, because it's always found its way. Mm -hmm. What about you, Natalie? What do you see in that? Yeah, I think it goes probably goes back to what you were saying about the natural undulation between getting caught in and associating with thinking and then coming out of that. And I'm seeing more and more recently that the idea of me, this this separate self, this imagined me, only arises simultaneously in the thinking, which I hadn't really seen properly before. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in that space outside of that, that's the clarity in seeing that, oh, the anxious me is only in that thought arising, and then it dissipates. And then it arises again, and then it dissipates. So the quality of knowing there's an anxious me in that thought helps me to see I probably shouldn't be trusting the content of that thought moving. Yeah, it can happen. Like you say, it's a completely normal experience because it's part of the design. But for me, recognizing that, I've just been able to see more clarity around, oh, it's coming and going, this I. It's not, it's not a constant thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not really an answer to the question directly, but it, it kind of it kind of shows me that there isn't this continuum of a me that's really anxious that needs to do something about the future. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a happening that's arising and then there's all, oh, there's an anxious me and then it goes back down again. Yeah, it just but, looks like a continuum. <clears throat> yeah. It's almost like it's, it's that sense. I know what you're saying. It's, it's entwined within the thought at the same time. Mm -hmm. They come together, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's embedded into it. And often what we're talking about, you know, when people say you feel your thinking, it's like, well, you feel your sense of your thinking as an identity when it arises. Mm. That's what you feel. Mm -hmm. You don't feel your thinking. You feel this sense of you at the same time that, that's intertwined with a thought and that, and it's almost like they're, they're wrapped around each other and you can't mm -hmm. um, pull one out from the other. Well, it's like that two sides of a coin thing, isn't it? Mm. You don't yeah. get that, that personal level I based thinking without a feeling of insecurity at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, it might show up as frustration or um, or competition or fairness ideas or, mm -hmm. yeah, this shouldn't be happening to me stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. not surprising really that, that that feeling of I does seem so constant because we've been taught it so long to believe in it. Um, and also, so there's, um, there's like an experiment, I did it with my son once, um, where you, you had to sit for, I think it was just 30 seconds or a minute, and count the number of times, just, just while sitting, that you had an I-based thought. Um, and of course, you find that it's like a lot, mm. at least like two thirds of the thoughts that come to your head are, are around I. Why am I doing this? What's the point? What will I do after this? You know, the I is just so, yeah, so present in everything. Mm. And so it's not surprising we think that it is therefore a permanent experience. Mm. and it is yeah it's the the more you delve and dig and the more you inquire you realize how it does come and go mm -hmm. yeah 
and and, he, and just back to that point, like even when it's here, I really want people to see that it's not about then trying to push it away. No. Then go, oh right, so I just need to get rid of this idea of I, yeah. and mm -hmm. then I'll be okay. And but that's still just coming from the same thinking that yeah, yeah, yeah. what's here right now isn't okay. Yeah. And that comes to what you're saying, Gary, and the real allowing and acceptance of all of it, whatever it is, including fully I based content of mm -hmm. I won't be okay because if I lose my job, no, 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 no. It's it's really in the in the allowing of all that and knowing that we can handle all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you say to people, when have you ever had an experience you couldn't handle? It doesn't just doesn't exist. It's not it's not possible. We can literally handle everything. Mm. How we do it will be different every time. Mm. It could be lumpy and bumpy and ungraceful and full of tears and upset. Who knows? But it's it's knowing that that's all okay too. Like we don't need to run from these things. Mm. That I think that things. yeah, that's we've been taught that's not okay. We've been taught to not have those experiences or make them stop or control them somehow. And the idea of a right way to do it is the thing that's causing all the stress. If we know there's a right way to do it, then inherently there's a wrong way to do it as a result of that. And we're so frightened of doing it the wrong way that we're like, oh, my God, I could get this so wrong. How do I make sure I don't get this wrong? You know, so we can see how we've made it so hard for ourselves by by making it look like there's only one way to navigate. And if I make the wrong choice, then what does that mean about my life moving forward? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of stuff at the moment about um, like breaking from the norm and being the individual you're meant to be. Yeah. So in in our ideas of what kind of kind of security, we've gone along with, yeah, the norm. We've gone along with, oh yeah, we go to school, we go to college or uni, we get a job, we yeah. get a house, we have a family, no, 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 all the yeah standard societal norms and and I think there's a shift happening now of well I guess it has been for a while like entrepreneur entrepreneurialism in younger generations has been on the rise for a while hasn't it where people are like no I don't really like the look of that sort of sheep dip approach to life <laughs> and I want to do my own thing <clears throat> so I think there's something kind of happening around um yeah life being disruptive with us so that we can start being who we are here to be and not just saying oh well you know this is the the good steady job I've I've always had or always done and mm -hmm. and inviting us to step out of that and inviting us to see there's a there's a unique way for me to live and you to live and and that's where the fullness of life is that's where the yeah the the aliveness and and, and literally fulfilling rewarding part of life is so we've kind of been on this like steady treadmill trying to keep it all right mm -hmm. and normal mm -hmm. contained and controlled and it, it feels to me like this is this is the time for life to start bursting out and going no actually given there is no right this is mm -hmm. what i'm going to be doing exactly so much i said on the live stream is that right and wrong andrew uh, just said right and wrong is a continuum not an absolute yeah, because it's relative, isn't it, too? Yeah. 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 It's true. I mean, is that, you know, the, you know, that's when we're back in this kind of the, the mind, the intellectual mind splitting things into mm -hmm. two parts. It's like, oh, this and that, up and down, left, right, right, wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just your idea of what you think right and wrong is. Yeah, um, I'm not even sure that right and wrong is a continuum. Yeah. It's because there is no there's no truth in any of it, is there? Like if you have it's a crime, if a crime yeah. so, so let's extreme example. Somebody murdered somebody. Mm -hmm. The family of the, the person who's died are clearly desperate and sad and, and want the person to take his justice. The friends of the person who's killed the person think he's a genius and like brilliant. You should be mm -hmm. put on a pedestal and held in high esteem. Mm. Maybe the parents of that boy are, are ashamed or, you know, who knows? There's like there's no there's no one truth around right and wrong mm -hmm. even in something we might consider like a normal yeah it's wrong to kill people but but not everybody in that situation would agree that that was wrong so that's not even true yeah i suppose maybe from your from the perspective of 
of where you are sat here is that maybe sometimes right and wrong is a continuum is whether but um, i don't know i think you're probably i was gonna say right but <laughs> i love that <laughs> <laughs> anyway i've anyway, got a completely track to track i mean the, the one thing about sort of making this a little bit more practical really for people is that there is just so much opportunity in the world and it, and it seems like we're in this, this mode of scarcity and that mm. we, we live in this, oh, we haven't got resources, we can't do this, there's not enough jobs going around. It's, I, that's not true. You can create anything you want to create. And, you know, there, there are people that are on YouTube playing video games, making money. <laughs> making yeah. millions. Yeah, My kids yeah. watch them. Yeah, and tell you know, me how much they're earning. Yeah. <laughs> and at some point, you know, there's there's people that like oh, say, "What? Well, that's that's not a job, what, isn't it? Why isn't it? Yeah. Why is that not approached with the same yeah. level of professionalism that they do? There's people that sit there, they make really good videos, yeah. they have the equipment, there. It says form of entertainment, yeah, and, and you know, why isn't that? You know, in a in a com world of complete freedom, why isn't that mm -hmm. not acceptable? But isn't that always like the caveat for why we, we don't do what we would love to do? You know, yeah. a lot of people you talk to say, well, I'm in this corporate job, but I can't leave it because I've got this extension that's going on and the mortgage and whatever. Yeah. And I'd love to do that over there, but I can't make enough money back for that because that's, that's, that's just a dream, you know. Yeah. But then, it's, yeah, but within that... Too many people. People. Sorry, Natalie. <clears throat> you go. Go on, I, <laughs> I honestly have finished. You go, you go in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's really easy to go, well, I can't do that because I've got all this. Mm. But you don't need to have all that. Like, yeah. there are different ways to, to live life. And so, you know, I've said that before. We don't have to live here. If we ever needed to downsize, if you ever wanted to quit your job and, and we just do something else, then fine. We go and live in a hut somewhere. Mm. It doesn't it doesn't matter and there's always we are infinitely creative I mean, mm -hmm. if you look around you in your local area I don't know what what's happened with you guys but around here you know within days actually there was a local Italian restaurant who lost their chefs because they went back to Italy to understandably be with their families mm -hmm. and so the owner and his wife who stayed here within days had out flyers saying we're baking fresh bread mm -hmm. put your orders in we'll deliver the next day or come and collect the next day um, other local businesses, so pubs and cafes who, who are doing delivery services or collection services, all obviously within like the, the appropriate cleanliness and distancing, etc. But um, it's, yeah, the, the creative genius of us as humans, we, we will always find something else. We will always create something else. And everybody who I know who's been in a redundancy situation has come out of that and flourished. It's it's it has been like life bursting out going oh wow look at all this right look what I can play with look what's available what what am I going to be now like who what do I want to do it's just yeah there is so much available when we when we start to dissolve the the fixed ideas we've had of this is the right way this is how it should be this is what's necessary really none of that is true there's always space within that as I say, maybe the question to ask yourself is not to ask yourself, how do I survive? How do, how do I, you know, meet these um, attachments I have to objects or things? Just ask yourself, or well, how do I use this opportunity to serve life? You know, what do I, how do I do it to serve this, this thing that's going through me, this, um, this energy that I, that I am and this experience that I am? How do I use it to serve that instead? Mm. Um, and have a more kind of open, expansive questioning process to yourself. And, Mm. I'm a big fan of inquiry and inqu asking yourself yeah. these kind of questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think we shy away from that so much. We shy away from being curious about why we do what we do and, you know, why a thought, why well, our belief looks real and why we hang on to it. But mm -hmm. it's only when we approach it with that open hearted and open minded curiosity that we can then see through it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and questions seem, I remember learning this in my original coach training just the power of asking yourself a question and then going to sleep mm. and seeing what occurs the next day. Yeah. Whether that's a, an idea occurring or just activity occurring. Um, and even just a simple question like, what's the next thing to do? Mm. Mm. What's the next step to take? Mm. 
And I used to want an instant answer in whenever I did that because that was obviously an instant <laughs> thing. Like, come on, let's get this resolved and moved on to the next thing. It's the right time scale. Yeah. yeah. I thought I've not had my wisdom drop yet. Why so happened? Um but but now there's just like I can let stuff like that hang a lot more and go, yeah, that's cool. That's going to just hang and, tr- and I'll trust what comes out of that. But I think it's really good to, to ask, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and always, uh, as you know, and we're told it so often, so often, so listen to your heart. And, you know, people say, what does that mean? It's like, well, it just means exactly that. <laughs> listen to, to this part of your body and ask yourself you know well what is it that opens this up what is it that leads me into this expansiveness what is it that takes me in a direction where i'm just i, I feel more than i than i than i've done in the past and listen to that voice because so often not listening to, to that part of you um that part of you that that you know makes you feel more than you are right now um without the the fear and the anxiety and just say okay well yeah thanks you know we're dead anyway, so I'll just forget about that and let's go for it anyway and see what happens. Um, because sometimes, you know, what have you got to lose? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes that's the invitation life gives you, isn't it, when you're in extreme mm-hmm. situations? Yeah. Yeah. And that's literally the message that you hear saying, well, yeah, why not? What have you got yeah. to lose? Mm-hmm. What's the worst case scenario? Gary, you go and work in a shoe shop? Sure. <laughs> it's, gonna happen. It's, gonna, it's gonna happen one day <laughs> yeah but also don't, don't be so tied to these kind of ideas of who you thought you were going to be i mean i yeah. i mean i um i came out of my uh when awakening happened uh, um and then i had this kind of like uh, what was it period and then i went and did the yoga teacher training and then um, i got the back injury um, and now I'm kind of like, well, actually, is yoga, being a yoga teacher actually on this? Is it something that I want to do now? I'm, I'm a bit further along now, and I'm questioning that now. I'm saying, well, maybe that's not mm-hmm. who that I thought I was going to be. I thought this was going to happen. I was going to be a yoga teacher and uh, go through that. And, you know, even though I'm doing my yin yoga teacher training at the moment, it's I, I noticed that it doesn't want to do it, and, and, and I'm not judging it. it wants to get the qualification but it's not really kind of like oh, this is something that's in my future it's the there seems to be something else happening at the moment where i'm focusing more on um teaching kind of spirituality and, and going down that route and it's there was a part of me because my identity so much was, was wrapped up in militant atheism and you know rationality and things like that and that 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 part of me was going well you can't go down that route you can't um, surrender to that but that's like oh, okay well fine let's just go do that and see what happens because you just don't know where life is going to take you and once yeah. you let life live you then it becomes you know that's when the journey starts mm-hmm. up until that point you've just been you know in the holding pattern waiting for it to start so it's just saying right let well, life live you i can all that stuff before it is necessary like all yeah. that we can't yeah it's all it's all it's all it it's all it, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> all so you getting to this point of going, yeah. you know. And and I'm sure for a lot of people that whatever this opportunity brings, if you do get made redundant and there is job insecurity, I'm sure if you go back and ask these people like two or three years down the line from mm. where they are now, they'll be like, oh, no, it's the best thing that happened. Mm. you know it really was something that which doesn't take away from the fear and the anxiety which is all yeah. completely fine mm. that you're going through right now you know it doesn't mean that you don't feel those things knowing that it's probably going to turn out okay mm. it doesn't mean that you don't feel those things mm. right now because it becomes very trite um advice to say oh yeah we're fine we're fine mm. you know that's that's not what we're saying mm-hmm. um we're just saying hind- that, yeah <laughs> yeah hindsight's a beautiful thing in terms of it makes a lot more sense doesn't it from that point of view when you're going mm. through what looks like a crisis yeah. And then something emerges and then you go, mm. oh, God, obviously that was going to happen because that took me to there. And then, yeah. you know, I get to do this or whatever. So I think just trusting that that will unfold and then you, there will be clarity, even if there isn't now. Yeah. And I guess kind of leaning on what we said last time in last week's conversation around where we were talking about positive thinking and gratitude, mm-hmm. and all, you know, practices that people might implement to try and keep themselves upbeat so I guess recognizing that with this situation where you could be full of fear and insecurity and thinking, oh my God, what does my future look like? During that time, all sorts of things could occur to you to do, like starting yoga, like doing a breathing mm-hmm. practice, like doing 
meditation, like doing um, positive thinking, any of those things could occur mm. to you. And that's fine. Like just really re-emphasizing that point from last week. We, It's never been about don't do those things. It's recognizing that these things come into our experience and then they might go again. Mm. And for as long as they're looking like the thing to do, they'll be done. Mm. And and at some point, if it's not to be done anymore, then it will it will go. And all of this is kind of, I, can't, I don't think we mentioned this last time. I can't remember if I did. But what's come up for me over and over again today is um, the sort of natural cycle of life of yeah. creation, maintenance, destruction. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. life is designed for. Mm-hmm. And really, right now, we're in this huge experience of destruction where life is taking away a whole bunch of stuff that we've we've been maintaining and holding to and believing as fixed and essential. And those things never were. And so what's what's available on the back of this because as destruction comes and space is created then something else appears and something else comes in its place so same with all those practices where it might occur to do something that's in the realm of well-being and self-care great and do it for as long as it as it's useful and then let it go at the point it stops being useful because and also trust that it's okay anyway because if we try and cling and maintain life we'll find a way of yeah it will clearing it out and saying no <laughs> enough of that now stop it <laughs> <laughs> cool so do we have any questions from anybody um, I don't or... know. We'll, we'll put the question out there and see if any comes out but, uh, mm-hmm. we'll see so we'll put silent bit now on the box yeah we we'll we'll <laughs> just wait to see if anyone <laughs> A little interlude music. Everyone <laughs> sing. No, it's just fun to remember. We'll do it sooner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the people can chip. Yeah, but also next week, chip in as we go. Like it's really cool to yeah. mm-hmm. interrupt our flow with. Yeah, because <laughs> we obviously talk over each other all the time. Nice one as well. Doing that. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you think that? you guys would want to say about this the end is never the end until it's the end mm-hmm. so you know, there will be something that comes next mm-hmm. and whatever that whatever that is it will be okay it will be mm-hmm. what was meant to come next you know, I'm not going to say it'll be okay because you know, we're always okay but mm-hmm. you know, whatever comes next is is meant to come next yeah you know, you know, so as long as it's not the end then move on to the next moment um and some people can hear like passiveness in that can't they i know we've talked about this before and like oh well i don't do anything i just wait for stuff to come to me yeah. well it's not it's being receptive and being open and then moving from that space to take whatever action feels right in that moment yeah. well you mm-hmm. are action that's the point isn't it i mean yeah, um, yeah. you yeah, know yeah. this is the the misunderstanding of karma is that people think you know karma is about good and bad again this idea of mm. right and wrong mm. um, mm-hmm. um and then uh yeah and that there's you know karma is a the action is a, is a revisiting of what you've done in the past but really what they're saying is that karma is just action and you take action all the time you know there's not a time that you're not in motion at some point and it's trusting whatever motion's happening is the thing that needs to happen and and just you know you're going to be taking action and when we say there's nothing to do it means that there's nothing to, for this idea of myself to do mm-hmm. because the idea of myself to do only exists in thought and it's not taking any action anyway mm-hmm. you know, it's taking some idea of an action why mm-hmm. this is still doing its thing mm-hmm. so allow it to do what it needs to do and, and if it needs to sit in anxiety and fear then let it sit in anxiety and fear knowing that's the right thing for it to do right now because mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the next thing will be the right thing for it to do as well Mm. But yeah it's sounding to me like it's the dance with life yeah it becomes you a dance then you don't sit at the side and let the music play mm-hmm. you get up and join in and mm-hmm. you take some wrong step wrong steps <laughs> <laughs> we fall over we hurt ourselves we cry yeah exactly yeah. we said before it's like jazz and sometimes you listen to jazz and you're like oh jesus christ i've got this bit i wish this bit was over <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, yeah, and the next bit, like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know, and you can't get the next bit until you've had that bit. I mean, it's just yeah. the way it works. 
and all that jazz. <laughs> uh, Andrew just commented, everything will be okay, all right, in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. <laughs> okay. Good. Cool. I think that may be a wrap, do you think? Or is there anything yes, else you want to add? It's cool. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us again this week. We're really enjoying doing the live um, live streams on YouTube, which will stay up, obviously, if anyone wants to catch it afterwards. Um, this will be available via our podcast tomorrow, so look out for um, social media channels. You can pick that up and via our website, whatdoyoubeenlookingfor.com. Um, we're going to continue with the live stream next Thursday at 1 p.m. GMT, and I think we're going to be looking at comparison, because that features in so many areas of our lives, and it's such a you know a tendency we all fall into so we'll look forward to exploring that then we hope to join you next thursday thanks a lot then thanks, thanks Take care. Bye. 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 bye bye